Okay, it's 11 o'clock. All right, okay. <laughs> okay, I want to welcome all of you. Look at how many people, as I'm watching you connect and get in here, just welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so fun to see my screen lighting up. All of you attending, my word, James and Jake and Denise, Violet. Oh, it's so good to see you, Amy. Oh, Ashley, Lisa up there in Boston, Drew. Oh, Elizabeth, you're looking awesome today. Miranda, well, Don Soroka, I, I mean, all of the names that are coming from the past, Julie and Debbie and Eileen, I'm just so excited to see you all. I am more excited because the lady that is on the call today, I know you're here to see her and I don't wanna take a lot of time away from her because Susan was, as you know, one of the coaches that catapulted my career. She helped me in so many ways, not to say, I mean, it was a blast to be at her treehouse and to spend time with her and everything and to have her come and speak with us at Coaching Skills Camp. For those of you who were at the very first Coaching Skills Camp, I had Susan at each and every one of them. And one of the highlights, uh, Kathy Oaks, was the fact that she was actually at my home and she would stay here with Tony and I. And of course, I just love asking her questions and could listen to her for hours. One thing that you do not know about Susan, yet I found out, is we were outside on the patio one day and this bird was chirping. To me, it was a bird chirping. And Susan told me what bird it was, all about the bird, and she really piqued my interest. And actually, I became quite fascinated with, of course, uh, Tony's son being a bird watcher. Uh, I found myself intrigued with every bird that was around our house. And it, so I learned more about this lady and how what a vast knowledge she has about the world. The main reason, though, that we're here today, I don't know about you. I don't like hidden agendas. I've never liked them. You ever been in one of those meetings that you just felt there was something behind the scenes and you didn't know what it was? You just had this eerie feeling. Well, I call that a hidden agenda. And I'm going to be right up front with you right now today. I want to bring forward the agenda that I have. Number one is to learn from Susan Scott. More importantly, it's to sell a bunch of these books right back here. And I positioned that just for that reason, because Fierce Love, as I have read this book, I, people think it's all about a relationship with just your spouse or a loved one. No, no, it is so much more. It's about having a conversation where your clients can fall in love with what you do and how you service and how, what you do for them in regards to helping them find a home or as the leader, that it truly comes out that you love people and use things and you never get the two confused, right? And so we're putting this up and I'm going to put it up from time to time on the screen because this QR code will allow you to go in and buy the book. Now, you know me, I've always had a goal. And with Clint, my goal was to sell 200 books. Well, we made that goal that day. And Ashley Lund, thank you. You bought a bunch of them. Appreciate that so much. And today, why would I do any less for Susan, right? So uh, if you've already purchased the book, just put it in chat as you buy the book. I want you to place it in chat hey, I just bought a book, or hey, I bought 10 for my ALC, or I bought five for my team, or buy 70, give them away for Christmas next year. We don't care because I don't know about you, and I'm going to stop talking here after this statement. The world needs more love in it. The Beatles had it right. All you need is love. So Susan, I'm going to just start out with this wonderful story that you started the book with. Is that a true story when she took the rings? And, I, and I'm not going to give the story away. I'm, yeah, no, I'm happy to tell that story. And by the way, I saw a couple of comments in chat from some of you who have bought the book and who've loved it. And I love you right back. I really, I really do. I think this is the most important book that I have written. 
But by the way, that bird was a, is a canyon wren. And if you guys go look up canyon wren bird song, you will understand why it is my ringtone on my iPhone. I mean, it is beautiful. And that's what was so stunning to me. So, um, so the, the, the story in the beginning illustrates a very important sort of why behind all everything fierce. You know, we always start every training, every meeting, every talk with a why. It has to be clear and compelling. Otherwise, people won't necessarily um, practice the what. So one of the whys comes from um, Ernest Hemingway. Uh, and the sun also rises when someone asked him, you know, the character, how did you go bankrupt? And he responds gradually and then suddenly. And I remember laughing and, and having a, um, an epiphany after all those years of working with uh, CEOs and their leadership teams is that our careers and our companies and our relationships and our lives succeed or flatline or fail <clears throat> gradually then suddenly one conversation at a time so the story by the way each chapter in the book has a story a true story that illustrates what was going on with a couple and how they used the conversation in that book um, to to help them so <clears throat> but okay and then who are you hoping I can hear somebody, but I don't know what I just heard. Somebody was talking. I missed that. I, was, I don't know. Anyway, I'll continue. Susan, you're muted. How did that happen? Uh, we muted everyone out, so you couldn't hear the background noise. So now oh. you have the screen. Okay. Okay, I did, you know, tech, I am not a whiz at technology, so I know I didn't mute myself, I didn't think. So the, the story opens with a, a about a, a couple named Tom and Louise, they're, those are not their real names, but they are very real people. And they had been married for 10 years, and they had really, really grown apart. Um, they'd been madly in love and lust at the beginning of the relationship, but things got very quiet very quickly because they just, they did have some issues that they were unable to have a decent conversation about. And, and one or both of them would get triggered and leave the room or just shut down and it would be very quiet in their home. And their home, their home became just a, a house, not a home. I mean, they were sharing it, but it, it didn't feel like a marriage. And th this was a married couple. And um, it just got really, really, really quiet. And their interests continued to diverge so that they were both headed in different directions, which is not uncommon. But some of those directions were a conflict for one another. Um, so Louise was very unhappy, and but she could, she persuaded Tom to go with her to the UK to do some training there because they both were great facilitators and they worked really well together. And it was the one thing that they loved doing together. So they, you know, here they were going to the UK, and she persuaded him to go with her after this to up to the Lake District and and walk around one of the beautiful lakes. And this is in Northern England. He, he was kind of grumpy about it. He didn't really want to go, but she said, please, please, you know, we're going to be all the way over there. Um, I just want to take advantage of this because one of her favorite things was taking walks in, in beautiful places. So they went and um, they're on this walk and he is sort of stumping along the path in front of her. And one of the things that crossed her mind was she, he never, he never walks beside me. He's always in front of me. And he just seemed very grumbly. And here they are in this gorgeous to die for landscape alongside this beautiful river uh, leading towards a lake. 
And they stopped along the way and had lunch. Um, the B and B owner had packed them a lunch, and 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 she said, you know, Tom, you you don't seem to be enjoying yourself. And he said, well, frankly, I'd I'd rather be golfing. That was her suddenly. She broke at that point. She broke. And she was suddenly clear that every single conversation that they had been having was like a small diminishment until it was as if they'd pulled off their own wings. And here they are, and he's saying, I would rather be golfing. She didn't realize that that a comment like that would bring her to her suddenly, but it did. And they finally, they get to this lake <clears throat> and they're standing there and she asked him to take off his wedding ring, give it to her. And he was reluctant, but he did. And she put it in her hand and she pulled off her wedding ring. She kissed her hand and then she hurled the rings out into the lake. And they both stood there kind of shocked at what she had done. And she, she turned to him and she said, well, now we will always remember exactly where and when our marriage ended. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. I can't get it clear today. <clears throat> he was stunned. He didn't see this coming. She didn't see it coming that day. She sort of had been thinking about how unhappy she was and how unhappy he was. But she didn't think that today would be the day that she announced that she wanted to leave the marriage, but she did. And the point is, one of the things about conversations is that we, we always wake up when we arrive at a suddenly, whether it's a wonderful suddenly to celebrate or a negative suddenly that is horrifying, broke our hearts, we didn't want it. We always wake up when we arrive at suddenly. But sadly, we're often sound asleep during gradually, which is where we live 99% of our lives. And so one of the big reasons why I'm offering fierce love to you is so that you can stay awake with your partner during gradually, that you will be current with one another, that you will talk about if there are any issues that are seeming to derail you in some way or harming the relationship so that you can clean it up if possible, get back on track and move towards the beautiful series of suddenlies that you want where you just look at one another and you realize, wow, you know, I still, after all these years, find you to be the most appealing, attractive, sexy, desirable, wonderful, intelligent human being ever. I mean, to have those, those moments after many years of being together, you know, so that's really the main reason why I wrote it. And, and the other one is, and a lot of you are, if you're familiar with Fierce at all, you know that I was really inspired when I heard David White, who is a poet from Yorkshire, England, spelled W-H-Y-T-E. He spoke at a conference I attended and he said, you know, the young man who's newly married is often frustrated, often perplexed, even irritated that this lovely person to whom he has plighted his troth, with whom he hopes to spend the rest of a beautiful life, insists on appearing before his face on a regular basis, wanting to talk yet again about the thing they just talked about last weekend, last week, and so often it has something to do with the quality of their relationship. And he wonders, why are we having this conversation again? Could we have one huge conversation about our relationship and then coast for a while? But here she is again. And David said, if he's been paying attention, at some point it will dawn on him that this ongoing robust conversation I've been having with my wife is not about the relationship. The conversation is the relationship. I felt like I'd been struck by lightning because I had just left a long-term marriage and I was heartbroken about it. 
but you know it was absolutely had to happen that didn't mean that i was okay with it or celebrating it or happy about it i was destroyed and i and mostly because i didn't understand why things had gone so wrong why we had drifted so far apart and what david said explained it all the conversation is the relationship so if the conversation stops well you can do the math or if you and i add another topic to the list of things we can't talk about because it wrecks another weekend then all of the possibilities for that relationship become smaller and all of the possibilities for the individuals in the relationship become smaller until one day I overhear myself making myself quite small, behaving as if I'm just a space around my shoes, engaged in yet another three minute conversation that is so empty of meaning it crackles. So this is, these are the premises on which fierce love um, is based that what gets talked about in a, in a relationship and how it gets talked about determines whether the relationship will thrive or flatline or fail. So Susan, I'm curious because many people on the phone, they have teams, they are over agents, they lead people. Uh, what you brought up is this gradually <laughs> then suddenly is how a lot of people leave their organization yeah. is uh, then also the conversation matters the topic that you can't speak about I, i'd like for you just to go a little bit further on how do we as leaders make that to where because i i know we've all been environments where oh don't bring that up that's going to cause a problem oh don't say that because somebody might get upset well yeah, I, I can say, I can talk about that. I do need to let you know that Fierce Love is focused entirely on romantic relationships. And one of the reasons I wrote it was because so many people said, oh my gosh, I'm loving Fierce Conversations and it helped me have a great <clears throat> conversation with my partner. <clears throat> Excuse me, I hate this <clears throat> frothing the throat. <clears> Another <throat> thing I can do. <clears throat> so, um, I don't even know where to start, Diana. I mean, I've written two other books all about being the kind of leader who, who Let's go on because the <clears throat> I'm gonna get some water. I'm gonna grab some water. Hang on. Water and I'll take a moment. If we have problems at home, doesn't that interfere with our problems at work? I mean, it really does. And everything that she's talking about. I think the gradually then suddenly shows up everywhere in our lives with the agents that leave us or we lead a company, whatever. And then also the fact that so many times every conversation either increases our, our relationship with someone or it decreases. So now that you've had some water and, and Susan, what I said was if we're having problems at home, it shows up in our work. And so, yeah, we're going to concentrate. And thank you for telling me that. I really appreciate that is that we're going to concentrate on the fact of our relationship at home. So what happens when you have a relationship at home where you say, oh, I better not bring that up because my spouse will be upset over it. And these conversations diminish more and more, even though we feel like we're empty and our conversations crackle. If they're there, how do we get out of that? Well, you, you know, sometimes people will say, well, I, I would love to talk with my partner about this, but he, she, um, doesn't want to talk about those things, you know, get, we'll get triggered, we'll get angry or whatever. And it's just not, it just doesn't work. I've tried it, it doesn't work. Well, I know quite a few families and organizations and teams that are completely controlled by one dysfunctional human being who refuses to talk about the things that really need to be talked about. And so I think you have to stop blaming it on the other person and say, maybe my approach has not been a, the right approach. Maybe 
how I try to talk with my partner about these things is, you know, it, it offends them, it triggers them. It's, it's um, no wonder it doesn't go well. You can't always be blaming it on somebody else or waiting for the other person to say, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about these really dicey issues with you today. Let's go there. I mean, don't hold your breath on that. So look, you've got to get out of the get out of the passenger seat and take the wheel. You have to drive. You know, where do you want your relationship to go? What role do you want it to play in your life? What do you want to feel like when you're with your partner or you think about your partner? And if it if you're not where you want to be, it's to just hang out in hope or to avoid it and pretend it's not as bad as it is, well, you know where that's gonna go. Gradually, 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 then suddenly somebody's gonna say, I'm not happy, I want out. Or <clears throat> I love you more than anyone in the world except for someone that I met at work, you know, or whatever. I mean, you, you, you have to stop. Well, you have, you have to decide what you want for yourself. And um, if you want something different, something more, something richer, sweeter, more profound, then that's up to you. Love doesn't make itself. We make it or we fail to make it and we unmake it as well. It's not as if God is up there ex machining everything that happens in our lives. Certainly not the amount of love we have. That's really up to us. And while it may seem complicated and scary and treacherous and all that, it really isn't. It's all about the conversations. So one of the things not everybody understands is that a fierce conversation you know, it's not about what I think of you and the horse you rode in on. It's 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 a very it's a very respectful and loving conversation. It's robust. It's honest. Um, one of the one of the one of the things that makes a fierce conversation fierce is that you're not trying to be right. You know, it, going back to the business world, Diana, I'm often saying to um, to leaders who are going to be leading a meeting. If, you're, if your agenda is you want to persuade everyone to your way of thinking, you're sunk, don't even bother. You know, a good leader doesn't, his or her goal is not to be right. The goal is to get it right for the, the group, for the organization. So let's get it right. And that's what you want to do in a, in a marriage. You want to get it right, not be right. You can be right all day long and be very alone and have a spouse that doesn't like you very much because you're always right about this and right about that. There is no wind, there's no beautiful red rose at the end of that driveway. So it's all about, you know, here's, here's, here's what's going on for me. Um, you know, what's happening for you? What are your thoughts about this in a non-accusatory way? Um, for example, let me give you a tip here. This is, there, there are, well, there are eight conversations, but there are seven magic words and a secret rule. I want to give you the seven magic words because they're really powerful. One of the ways we would stay current with someone is <clears throat> let's say we see something or we notice something um, that we just really, really love about them. Like, for instance, uh, one of my daughters, I was at their house and her husband, Chris, had been working with um, their daughters on homework. And when they were all done, Jennifer said to Chris, I do not know how in the world you learned how to be such a fabulous father. The way you worked with them, the way you helped the girls, the way you were patient, the way you were funny, the way you were kind, you know, you just, you just make my heart warm. I love how you are as a father. I love that about you. That's fierce. That is fierce. And we don't do nearly enough of that. So telling someone specifically what it is that we love about them, not just love you, honey, bye, honey, thanks, honey. 
you know, that's, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but there's no, there's no gold there really. So it's better to say, you know, the fact that I just came home and you have already opened a bottle of wine and have started dinner, you are magnificent. You know, I mean, that's, that's fierce. By the same token, what if someone does or says something that is hurtful to you or concerning to you, you don't like it. Now, what I did in my marriage was I just, I just ate it. I just, you know, I just shut down. I didn't say anything. I didn't even want to recognize for myself how wounded I felt, how upset I was. I just shoved it all down. And of course it was all still there. But rather than doing that, what if you said, you know, I had really hoped that we were gonna spend some time together this weekend and you and I had talked about that. And yet you've just let me know that you've scheduled um, golf and you know watching football um, and that pretty much eats up the whole weekend. Can you tell me what's going on? Can you tell me what is going on? Those are the seven magic words. It's not coming out and saying, I don't feel loved. I don't feel appreciated. You said we were going to do this and now you're doing that and blah, 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 blah. you're just saying, here's what, here's what happened from where I sit. Can you tell me what is going on in a non-accusatory tone of voice? And that gives a person an opportunity to say either something like, oh gosh, I'm sorry, you're right. I let me let me figure out what to do. Or an issue comes up, an issue comes up that needs to be discussed. And you, you know, you're off and running with that. So I I think, I mean, it's it's what we teach in how to give feedback in the workplace too. You know, I I remember. I remember walking through the office one day and I heard one of our salespeople yelling into the phone. I was pretty sure he was talking with a client. And, and when he was, when he hung up, I went to him and I, using our approach, I said, was that, was that a client? And he said, yep, yeah, that was so-and-so with such and such a company. And I said, well, but you were yelling, you were yelling. Can you tell me what was going on? And he said, yes, she's pretty deaf. She can't hear, she won't wear hearing aids. And she's constantly saying, say it louder, say it louder. And I end up yelling, I love her, I love her. And I just, I have to laugh, but I know I end up yelling. So that, that was so useful for me to understand. And he and I were both laughing then. And he was telling me more about this particular client. And the thing is, here's what we do. We, this is a human thing. We all do this. I do this. We make up stories about other people. And then we behave as if our stories are true. And they rarely are. So when you catch yourself putting an interpretation on something that your partner did or said, and not liking it very much, check in don't just live with that interpretation check in you know here's here's what happened here's what you said here's what i saw can you tell me what's going on and then then you can have a conversation and it's not it doesn't feel like some kind of an argument or you know this negative place to be in so i know i realize that i'm like <clears throat> a pinball machine i'm just zooming all around think you know my mind i sometimes feel like like my mind is like a like a, a laptop. I've got 19 tabs open, three of them are frozen. I have no idea where the music is coming from. You know, it's just crazy, crazy in my head. So I realize that I'm uh, I'm drifting. And Diana, feel free to bring me back to anything you, you want. You are doing you are doing so good. I I love the one part in your book though where you talked about a genuine apology. You actually started out the chapter with a quote about a genuine apology. Tell us a little bit more about that. See if you see if you can find that quote in there. See if you can find, yeah, you've got the book and I don't remember what, what the quote is exactly. 
but I, I know that. Um, oh, here it is. It's, uh, it's um, uh, Jacqueline Bussey, a genuine apology is like an 11th hour rain on a dusty cross. Grossly overdue, but miraculously just in time. Ooh, I'd forgotten about that quote. That's a good one. I'm glad it's in there. Okay. All right. So um, my mother, who's been gone a very long time, I don't think my mother ever apologized for anything. And I know lots of other people who just cannot bring themselves to say, I am so sorry for what I just said. I, I apologize for what I did. Yeah, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, there's a writer in Quebec named Louise Penny, and she has this wonderful series based on these uh, Inspector Armand Gamache, who's head of the Sûreté in Quebec. He is a wonderful character and he is always advising his trainees and one of the things he says to them, there are, some, there are some things you must learn to say and you must say them. One would be, I was wrong. Please forgive me. <clears throat> I need help. I don't know. I love that. It's very rare to hear someone say, I was wrong. What I just said and did. I wish I could take that back. I want to do over. That was not good. And I, I apologize. Now notice it, it, it's different if you hear someone say, I'm sorry you feel that way. Don't tell me you're sorry I feel that way. Tell me you're sorry that what you said or did caused me to feel that way. I need to know that you get it, that you understand that what you just said or did was hurtful, offensive, upsetting. So don't, and don't tag on an excuse. Don't say, oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm really sorry. I didn't blah, 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 but I've just been really busy. I've been really over, that is not an apology. That is not. You just have to say, I see what I see what I see what I just did. I see what I just said. Since I can't take it back, let me just say, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Let me do this. Let me try again, you know, and just do that. And don't, I, I hate it when, um, especially in politics, you'll hear the, yeah, mistakes were made. It's like, what? What? I mean, wouldn't it be nice if those pesky mistakes would stop making themselves. <laughs> it's like, there's no actor here. There's no person here. So it's not, it, it doesn't feel good when you put it off as if it's somehow outside of you, it's not connected to you at all, or that you have a real good reason for doing or saying whatever you did, or that you don't necessarily have a problem with what you said or did, but you're, you're sorry that, your partner happened to have taken it this way and feels that way. I mean, those are not apologies. They aren't. So just, we just need to learn to say, I blew it. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And one of the other things this wonderful fictional character says is before you say anything, ask yourself three questions. Is it true? Is it kind? Does it need to be said? I love those. And asking that third one <clears throat> keeps me from saying a lot of stuff that I really wanted to say, was going to say, and realize I don't need to say that. I don't. In fact, I mean, one of the most wonderful things about a great fierce conversation is usually if you're the one that's sort of driving it, you're saying very little. And the other person is doing a lot of talking and you're asking questions. You're saying, tell me more about that. Just for example, I have seen a gazillion conversations that could have been really interesting stopped dead in their tracks because the, the person who's asking a question doesn't pick up on the fact that, oh, there's another question and another question and another. For example, if someone says, <clears throat> independence 
my independence and freedom is really, really important to me. So I've seen people say, okay, yeah, and move right on. Instead, what if we said, talk about that? What does independence and freedom mean? You know, what, what would that look like in an ideal world? You know, and, and is that like number one on your list of things that are important to you and how did it get there? Why is it so, 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 so important? And then whatever they say is gonna give you another 16 questions to ask so that they feel really seen and heard because they were seen and heard. So you see that <clears throat> warthog on the wall behind me? Not everybody has a warthog on the wall behind them, but I do because it reminds me of a greeting in um, Africa. Um, and I've spent some time there. In fact, I'm going back again this fall. Um, when two people are out with their cows, their sheep, their goats, their, not, they don't have sheep, but goats and cows out there on the Masai Mara, and they come upon one another. The first person to speak says, Sawubona, which means I see you. And the response is Sikhona, which means I am here. And the order is important. It's as if until you see me, I do not exist. And I think what happens in so many marriages is that we really stop seeing one another. When we were dating, when we were hanging out in the very beginning, we asked a lot of questions. We paid fierce attention. We really wanted to know everything that we could know about this person. We had long conversations. Um, you know, people will talk about, oh, we talked in the phone for five hours. You know, I, gosh, that's a long time. And then if a commitment is made, married, move in together, whatever, then it's as if, okay, that's done now. Let's just get down to the figuring out how we live together. Um, I would love for you to put the toilet seat down, please. Would you mind doing that? <laughs> All right, you know, this little things like that. And who's going to walk the dog and who's going to fix dinner and who's going to this and, you know, what was happening at work and just that stuff, the little stuff, the little minutiae of the days. Because we think we've, we know everything that we need to know about this person. And we, boy, there's so much more that we could learn about this person. It should, there should be conversations from time to time where there is more, you learn more, you learn more, you learn more. And that deepens the connection. And of course, at the heart of all things fierce is my belief that if you want to be a great leader, if you want to be a great lover, if you want to be a great parent, great human being, you must gain the capacity and the courage to connect with the people who are important to you at a deep level or lower your aim. So fierce conversations, especially the ones in fierce love are designed to help you connect at that deeper level with your partner. Um, there is not enough Botox and filler in the world to keep ourselves that youthful, youthful, youthful looking person that maybe first attracted this individual with whom we are. There has to be something more than the physical attraction. That's important, it's there, it's juicy, it's lovely. And there has to be something more for people to stay together. There has to be a deeper connection. It can't be just, I love the way you look. Um, there has to be so much more. And so, you know, I, I just, I, I think it's really sad when marriages end or couples break up and they immediately go to somebody else um, for the guys. Often they go for somebody younger, prettier. And that just breaks my heart because they didn't have with their spouse or their partner, they didn't have the relationship that is so connected, so rich, so fulfilling, so <clears throat> meaningful <clears throat> that actually it, it's a turn on. It is a turn on to have these kind of conversations because you feel completely seen, completely seen by your partner in ways that you didn't even know you wanted to be seen. 
And when in any conversation, when just one person sort of tells their truth, a whole lot of fresh air comes into the room and just changes everything. Susan, I'm taking so many notes as I can see other people doing this. I just want to say, uh, as close as I can see, we're at 162 books, so we're getting up there to 200. Wow, guys, thank you. Yeah, I knew you would like that. And and I know that we'll hit the 200 mark. As, uh, text your friends. Tell them to get on. It's still not <laughs> yet too late to hear. Uh, one of the things I was talking to Susan about, well, well, first of all, Susan, I remember you talking about this book. Here well, you're, it's, I got the idea for the book in your swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> and you shared with us at yeah. skills camp just a portion of it to see if it would be accepted and the people were going give me more give me more yeah yeah and i laughed about the part where it says honey i'm home yeah tony is instructed <laughs> when he opens the door because our doors go <laughs> ding 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 and door yeah. is open and if it's late at night he has to say honey i'm home so when I saw that in your chapter, I went, oh. <laughs> That's <laughs> fine. <clears throat> we need to know whether it's our partner or a stalker who's just entered the house. So we do need to know that. It's just that that whole chapter is, is about how, if your partner has something important on their plate, uh, whether it's work-related or something, or health-related, whatever it might be, financial, whatever it is. It's a way to, to have a much deeper conversation with them um, so that you are helping them think through their issue and arriving at some point in at least one step that they are clear about that they want to take. And you're not advising them at all. You're not being their coach. You are simply asking seven fantastic questions that help your partner go deeper and deeper and deeper into clarifying the whatever the issue is. And it's it's similar to the the conversation that we teach in the business world. Um, and people do describe it as a coaching conversation. It's typically a one-to-one -one conversation. I've never thought of it as coaching because you're not telling somebody what to do. You know, I think of a coach as, you know, here's the play we're going to make and you need to take that hill and you need to do. And it's not like that at all, because when I started working with all those CEOs, I thought, what the heck am I going to do with them? I mean, I'm an English major for crying out loud. You know, here, here I have 30 totally different industries, different CEOs, I don't know anything about their businesses. I'm not going to be going in and advising them. I don't have a business degree. Um, and I'm certainly not a shrink. And I don't, you know, so it had to be, how can I, how can I spend two hours with them that would be worth it, given how busy they are? So that conversation is in fierce conversations and in our training, but it's also adapted for fierce love. And it's, I mean, that, that conversation in that chapter, getting past Honey, I'm Home, that model is my um, Swiss Army knife. I pull that out all the time. And so often, I'm not, I've had that conversation with strangers on a plane. And so often, at some point, someone will say, I can't believe I'm telling you this. And my, <clears throat> my thought is, I can't believe you're telling me this either. Um, and keep going because this is better than anything on TV. You know, it's like, wow, it's fascinating what people will share with you if you are asking the right questions and if your interest is genuine, you, you can't fake fears. So I just, I, you know, I really want people to understand how important their conversations with their partners are. It's not that every conversation has to be some big deep dive, but occasionally, you know, it's important to have conversations that make sure you are current 
that you are in agreement about where you're headed, that you still uh, love and value and hopefully desire one another because a lot of couples stop having sex because they can't have these conversations and they have all these walls between them. And that's a darn shame because, you know, intimacy, physical intimacy is a big part of connection. And, um, you know, how do you even have that conversation with your spouse when you haven't, you haven't made love for five years and a lot of couples haven't. So that's something to talk about. That is something to talk about. And I would want that for you. And Diana, I also have a little section on a couple of myths that really derail relationships. And um, can I just mention one of them? Okay. So, and so a, a couple, actually a Keller Williams couple, many years ago, visited me at my treehouse, where you've been, Diana. And we were sitting out on the deck, having a glass of wine, just talking. And I hadn't seen them in a long, long time. And they were catching me up on their lives and their kids and their careers and everything that was going on. And I just, the husband looked kind of, I don't know, uncomfortable or something. So at some point, I think this was our second glass of wine. That always helps. I think I said, is there something you're not telling me? And it got really quiet for a minute and then out it came. He had had, and by the way, this story is in the book. He had had an affair and it just almost broke them. I mean, they, they just barely survived, but they did. I and mean, he stopped the affair, they, they survived. And she looked at me and she said, you know, we both believe in unconditional love. And then she looked at him and she said, there isn't anything you could ever do that would cause me to leave you. I think I shocked all three of us because I jumped up and I said, take that back, take that back. You just gave him permission to have as many affairs as he might like to have. Not, and I turned to him, not that I think you're going to, but you now have permission to. You also have permission to do anything else you feel like doing, say anything you feel like doing that would hurt you, your wife or your kids or anything. You know, the idea that true love is unconditional is one of the worst ideas I've ever heard of. It is not. It's not that I'm trying to teach you how to be, but I certainly need to teach you how to be with me. There are conditions. And so one of the conversations is to clarify those conditions and talk about them. And by conditions, I don't mean that, gee, it would be nice if, I'm talking about the must have, must have. In order for me to want to stay in this relationship, in order for me to want to wrap my arms around you, in order for me to, to love you the way I did on day one, um, there are conditions. So what are they? And you know, they're going to be different for every couple, but for you to think through what they are and share those with your partner and ask your partner to give thought to his or her conditions and share those with you at some point um, so that you can see, are we aligned? You know, are, are we <clears throat> potentially off track or is anything one of us is doing um, out of bounds given conditions? So, so yeah, true love is not, it's just like, you know, one of the stupidest lines in all of, of, of movie land is, Love is never having to say you're sorry. It's like, that is so dumb, you know? And I think we all knew it when we heard it. I don't care who says it, but it's, you know, what beautiful or handsome actor says it, it is dumb. Just like conditional, unconditional love. Now, the, if you want unconditional love, get a dog. I have two. They give me lots of it and I love it. I love it. But no, if you're going to be in my life, um, both of us have to understand we we teach each other how to treat each other and we get what we tolerate. So if I'm tolerating something I don't like, it's not my partner's fault. It's my fault. I, ha I'm, I haven't said I don't like this. 
I really am worried about this. I find this upsetting or this, I'm angry whenever this happens. Um, and I don't want this to continue. It's for me, it is a big deal. So we, you know, we need, we need to communicate with our partners so that they know what's going on with us. They can't read our minds. You know, one of the, one of the myths is if you loved me, you'd know what I want. You'd know I, I'd want you to come up behind me and put your arms around me. You'd know I, no, 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 we don't know. You may have to hit us alongside the head with a two before. We don't know, tell us, please tell us. What is it that you would like? In fact, do what you would like. <clears throat> for instance, um, I have a lovely man in my life and for both of us, our love language is touch. And so, you know, when I'm thinking, oh, when, you know, when I'm at the sink or I'm at the, I'm cooking, I would love for him to come up and put his arms around me. What I do is when he's at the sink, he's cooking, I go and put my arms around him. And he loves that. And that gives him, sort of the, the idea of doing it for me, which he does. And so you go first, you know, if you, if you wish your partner would come over and sit beside you and cuddle with you and that's not happening, get up out of your chair and go over to your partner and sit down and cuddle with your partner, you know, model what it is that you want and ask for what you want. So I'm hitting the, hitting the pause button so that, Diana, you can take this wherever else you would like to go. I mean, there's... Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm taking so many no's. I've got, uh, I've got rules to live by here, according to Susan Scott. Uh, well, you, you've got it. It's all in the book. <laughs> I know. It's so good. Yet I still love just little tidbits because the way you say things, uh, you just come home. I love... Uh, if you want unconditional love, get a dog. I think that's so good. Now, I do know that uh, we may not want to open it up for questions. And sometimes when I ask questions, I'm not asking the ones that the people here would like to uh, ask. So if you want to put in the chat a question that you have or put in the chat, I have a question, then uh, we could unmute them without unmuting everyone. And that way uh, you'll have the floor. Yeah, please so, ask, ask your questions. Nikki, Nikki Fuller. Let's uh, take Nikki Fuller and bring her up. So Nikki, you're going to have the floor in just a moment. <clears throat> Unmute yourself. Is she unmuted? Go now, Nikki. Um, I loved your book. And I listened to it like I couldn't do anything else. I just started listening. It was great. My question oh. is, you talk about the model, Honey, I'm Home. Can you do me a favor and go a little bit further deeper into that? where you, you found that that is used in your everyday relationships with your loved one or when you do it with your kids, I have a 15 year old. So working yeah. on relationships and Diana knows because she's been a force for my daughter. Yeah. What do you do when you do that, honey, I'm home and you're dealing with someone who is in a weird space in their life. How do you use that more so in communication? I guess, can you use that in communication with Absolutely. your child? Absolutely. In fact, I do it with, I have granddaughters now who I have that conversation with them and they have learned to have it with their boyfriends and their friends. So if, you know, to, first of all, you have to get the, whatever, what is the issue? You know, what's the most important thing that you're grappling with these days? You're asking your person, what is the most important thing? that is on your plate or on your heart or on your mind. And, the, and if they say, oh, I don't know, say, well, what would it be if you did know? And you have to be careful how you ask that. Otherwise you can come across as a smart ass, which you don't want to do. But you know, what, what is really the, the most important thing that's going on for you these days? And then whatever they say, you drop into the questions. You know, so tell me what's going on around that. You know, what results is that creating? Um, what else? What else? What else? Wow, what results is this creating for you? How's this affecting you? And when you, when you ask that question, which you end up doing like several different times during this, how's this affecting you? That's when people feel like, oh, wow, you know, I, 
she really, she really, she cares. She cares about me and she's asking this question. And sometimes we don't even know how we are feeling ourselves until somebody asks us and then the tears come or whatever. And, and then you, and then, you know, the next is given everything that you have just described, all of the results that this is creating in your life, what do you feel? Well, I feel frustrated. Well, talk about that frustration. Tell me about that frustration. You're just, you're asking, asking, asking. And then, you know, going on to the next questions, if nothing changes, it's six months down the road, it's a year down the road, nothing has changed, then what's likely to occur, you know? And it's just taking anybody through those questions on any topic that is important to them. And it's great for our kids. It's great for family members. It's also great for clients and coworkers. I mean, it's just, and you know what? It's a great conversation to have with yourself from time to time, Nikki, you know, or ask somebody else to take you, take me through this, ask me these questions. Don't let me off the hook, you know? So I love it. I, I mean, have I answered, have I answered your question? Yes, I just, I ask her questions and I get this 15 year old look of, I don't know. And then I say, well, thank you. Cause Keller Williams taught me, if you didn't know, what would the answer be? And she looks at me and says, I don't know. So I don't want to take anybody else's time. I appreciate that. It's just age 15. I'm going to make well, it. Well, yes, yes. And I would probably say, cause I have two daughters myself. Uh, I would probably say to her, well, the thing is you do know. And I want you to give some thought to it and let's get together later on and you tell me what it is because I'm not going to accept, I don't know, you are not, you are smart, you know, or you're being too lazy to think straight. And I know you're not that person either. So I know you know, let's circle back. Yeah. Thank you. That is so good, Susan. I picked up on some words that you taught me a long time ago, and I'd love for you to share with the people. You always say, what do you feel? Not how do you feel? Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us about that. I just, you know, how do you feel isn't as, for me anyway, isn't as powerful as what do you feel? Um, because we're used to, well, how do you feel about that? Well, I'm not happy about, you know, I, I think I would rather get, a word, what do you feel? And usually it's frustrated, I'm frustrated. And then you can, you can say, talk about that frustration or I'm angry, talk about that anger or I'm worried or I'm sad or whatever. That is just, I usually get juicier responses to what do you feel than I would to how do you feel? And the worst question of all is how does that make you feel? I, that is, don't ever ask anybody that because nothing makes us feel anyway. You know, we just feel what we feel. But the reason why emotions are so important is because there's been tons of research by a number of people, one of whom won the Nobel Prize for it, discovery that we human beings make decisions and act on them first for emotional reasons, second for rational reasons. So if you allow someone to just stay in their head, there is no guarantee that they're going to take any action. And what you want as a result of this conversation is that they will have clarified at least one step that they are going to take and that they will take it. Otherwise, you know, if you don't, if you don't surface emotions, you, you haven't given the lit match something to ignite. It's like leaving somebody in a gorgeous sports car that has no gasoline in it. It's going nowhere. So it's very important to, to ask about emotion. And I like to say, what do you feel? And if they say, oh, I don't know, again, I say, well, what, what, what would you be feeling if you knew what you were feeling? What do you feel? I mean, I just don't let people get off the hook, but I, but I, I'm, I hope, hopefully do it in a, in a, a nice way. You know, I'm not trying to embarrass them or make them wrong or be lecturing to them or anything, but it's just 
we all pretend not to know a whole lot of stuff in our lives. And it's, it's a source of great pain for an awful lot of people. So Susan, I, I can't believe that our, our time is up here. And uh, you, you've given us so many great nuggets. And I'm going to ask Nicole, how many books have we sold? 184. Yeah. Golly, Moses. 184. So, oh, we're so close. Come on. <laughs> if we have 16 books, I'll buy two more myself. I mean, come on. Uh, we, we just need, I don't want to get off the phone without 200 sold. Who, who do you know that needs this book? Now, every one of us know a relationship that this would be a great book to give. Oh, gosh, people are saying, you know, they're, they're going to buy more books. And you guys there you go. Gonna... I'll buy four. Thank I'll make it. Yay! Thank you. Thank you, Give everyone. Give yourself a hand. 200 books. I'm just so oh. grateful. I really am grateful. Oh. Diana, you always have been a champion for so many people. Thank and I'm one of them that you have championed. And I really appreciate it. I just love you so much, Susan. You've been through so many things in in your world, um, just like all of us. Uh, we we all go on a roller coaster ride from time to time, and some people have bigger dips than others. And uh, you literally have been such a hero through your health, through your business, uh, through your entire life. You just continually show up as someone that is a uh, fierce person to deal with in essence you just keep going and you make the world such a better place ladies and gentlemen let's just really honor susan give give her a hand like this if you can so we know just magic hands wave hands love you love you love you love you too and, love you uh, right back i wish we were all together in person maybe we will be someday i would love, I love that. that yeah you know in teaching fierce conversations I learned so much from you and how many of you just by a show of hands like this uh if we were able to put something together and bring susan scott in uh whether it be in seattle or in austin or san diego or or wherever charlotte uh, i don't care would would you be up for attending if you were able and had the money to get there right okay great great kathy you in? come on let's go all right, we'll see what we can do. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Susan, thank you so much. Thank you. That was just lovely Bye. fun. <laughs> thank you.